Good afternoon, everyone, beautiful people. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, beautiful people. Good afternoon. You do know you're beautiful, don't you? I'm talking to the men just as much as the women there. I uh, just want to say uh, thank you very much uh, to Jess and the team for organising this wonderful event. And also, yes, to go to Monhan and to the really inspiring trip. Thank you very much for being my warm-up guys. Um, and also to you guys, because uh, I love to work with people who are committed to their own personal growth and healing. And after you know what I've experienced today and seeing you all and hearing the talks, thank you very much for uh, having the intention to come and give your time and money for your own personal growth and healing. So give yourselves a round of applause. I style myself as a one-legged existentialist stand-up beat poet and inspiration engineer. Just trips off the tongue. Um, and uh, my intention, so I'm trying to change my karma. Uh, my intention for this talk uh, is for you to leave uh, with an, uh, an absolute clear idea of the most important things that you need to do to manifest a magical, meaningful and fulfilling life. Because whatever it is we think we want to manifest, ultimately what we want to manifest is a magical, meaningful, fulfilling life. Man's search for meaning, meaning is the most important thing, fulfillment what we're all after, um, the, the magic of life is what we're all after. Can everyone agree on that? Yeah. So that's what I'm going to be focusing on, giving you uh, clear ideas of the most important things to do that. Uh, now, what I would like to do is to give a talk, uh, as Mohan did, uh, which was very interactive, where we asked questions throughout. Unfortunately, this talk, when I've done it before, it's a 90-minute talk. And I only have 50 minutes, so what I'm going to need to do, I'm going to need to ask your permission for a couple of things. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to have to basically pack the talk into half an hour so that we can have about 20 minutes for questions at the end. So the first thing I need to ask is, can we just be okay with asking questions at the end? Yes. Uh, great. Uh, there are going to be things that come up for you, so please make notes, write your questions down so you don't forget. And the second thing I'm going to need to ask is that, again, I'd like to do a, a very professional, well-presented talk with lots of breathing and space, as Philly did. Um, but I'm not going to be able to do that because I'm packing an hour and a half into half an hour. So I am going to have to basically go full power, top of my head, channel it, just pour it all out. And I, I want your permission to be able to do that because I'll feel a lot better because I I'd like to do it in a nice, slow, relaxed way. But I'm just not going to be able to fit it in, so I'm just going to give it full. Uh, is that okay? Okay. Here we go. <laughs> So the first thing you need to know, the most important thing to manifesting a magical, meaningful, fulfilling life is forget the fucking secret. <laughs> forget yes. the law of attraction. I've been trusted to do this. The secret makes me sick, literally and physically sick. Um, it's inaccurate. It's um, incomplete. It's immoral. And it's infantile. And the people who created that, the secret, are basically international drug dealers. <laughs> the secret of the law of attraction, they've created a drug uh, that's got millions of people addicted to this law of attraction thing. And just like the people who created Alcoholics Anonymous and the 12 Steps, that's what I feel this talk is about. It's about helping the people who are suffering from this delusion to kick their addiction and recognise what real manifestation is all about. So if you are a lover of the secret, you probably might want to leave now, um, because I really hate the secret, and I'm going to tear it to shred, shreds right in front of me right now. Okay, so I've got that off my chest. Thank you very much. Okay, so I know you do, because anybody who knows the truth knows that what it is, it's a, it's a, it's a pyramid scheme to make money. They're basically like any drug, you, anybody who does it gets a high from it initially and then it doesn't work and they don't realise why it doesn't work and then they keep going back to that website and keep buying more products. It's just very good marketing. Yeah. Um, anyway, so, um, why is, what's wrong with the secret? Why, what's the problem with the law of attraction? Because obviously there's some truth there, otherwise it wouldn't work at all. But it, the secret's in the title. The law of attraction means, to, if you're attracting something, you're bringing something to you, right? It's, it's all about what you can get it's all about what you can get. So the law of attraction is the, basically the law of getting, or in other words, the law of ego fulfillment. Or in other words, as the Buddha would put it, the law of suffering and dissatisfaction. 
guaranteed, built in from the beginning. It cannot work because it's coming from the wrong place. And even if it does work, okay, this is the first reason it doesn't work. So the, the law is basically, um, you know, similar to what Mohan said, early, said earlier on, energy follows thought. And, and the way they, they phrase it is that uh, like attracts like, so whatever you want in your life, focus on that, think about it, think about that. And as I say, there's some truth in that. The problem is, is that your conscious mind uh, can process about four bits of information a second. Your subconscious mind can process Sorry, your, your conscious mind can, uh, can process 40 bits of information a second, and your subconscious mind can process 40 million. Your subconscious mind is a million times more powerful than your conscious mind. So if you're consciously thinking about something, but your subconscious has a whole bunch of stories, programs, limiting beliefs in it that don't align with your conscious thoughts, guess what? you're going to have the experience that everybody in the world experiences, which is, I want to do this, but I can't do it. I want to do this, but I fail. I want to change this, but it doesn't happen. Yes or no? Okay, so that's what tends to happen. So if you follow the secret, what you'll find is, you will manifest something along the lines of what you're trying to manifest, but you'll get mixed results. So you'll get a bit of it, but not quite, quite what you want, or you'll get it in a package, in a form, not quite what you want. Right? Is that what, is that what people get? So that's what most people, 80% of people will get that, mixed results, so you know, they'll, they'll kind of see that there's some truth there, so it doesn't quite work the way I wanted it to, let me go back to the website and buy something else. Yeah, that's why I mean it's literally a drug addiction. Um, the 20% of people who do the thing you need to do, which is reprogram program your subconscious, deal with their limiting beliefs, there's lots of ways of doing that, so the people who are clever enough or know enough to be able to deal with the subconscious and get those... Uh, conscious thoughts in alignment with the subconscious do manifest what they want. However, because the whole thing is about manifesting what you want, even when they get it, they're unfulfilled. They're not happy anyway. George Harrison, the, the, the Beatle George Harrison said, the best thing about becoming a Beatle was that finding out at 23, at 23 that money doesn't make you happy. There's a book called Affluenza by a guy called Oliver James and he went around the world interviewing millionaires. They're all miserable. And it's basically because the basic spiritual understanding that everyone should know, but we live in a culture that teaches the opposite, is that you will never be happy and fulfilled through getting what you want. You will just have more wanting. Mm -hmm. It's impossible. It is absolutely possible. And I could give you a million examples of that. Um, and I'm going to do a poem now to illustrate, you know, so the question is, okay, Chris, smarty pants, what's the answer? So before I tell you the answer, I'm going to give you a poem that illustrates the answer, because I'm a poet and I like doing poems. Um, and this poem is actually about not only the answer to the, the problem of how to manifest things not from a place of want, but it's also the most important thing in our entire existence. And I tend to write poems about things that are really important, but no one talks about. And this is the most important thing, and no one ever talks about it. Um, any ideas, anybody, any ideas what it is? Mental health. Good answer. I always get different answers here. That's not, I'm not going to say it's not the right answer. That's not the answer I'm thinking of. Good answer, but not the answer I'm thinking of. Love. Love. Everyone always talks about love. It's got to be something that no one ever talks about, but it's usually important. Of course love, but people talk about that. Passion. Passion. Great answers, but again, people talk about that. Taking a dump. That is important. Imagine if we didn't. <laughs> But, um, but, people, but people talk about that all the time. I mean, I don't watch television, but apparently on ITV there always there's lots of toilet humour, so I'm not, I'm not sure that counts. Altruism. Altruism, that's a good one, but no? The money. Dying? Yeah, that's a very good one. I'm going to give you the answer because everyone's going to come up with a very clever answer that's not the right one. Uh, the answer is nothing. The answer is nothing. Space. The answer is the thing that we all, is the most important thing, but we we'll always forget about it. I'll describe, you know, the Taoist said, it's the hole in the wheel that makes the wheel useful. It's the space between the walls that makes the room. If you look at the universe, we all love the universe, stars and planets and moons and comets. We all love the universe. It's so beautiful, isn't it? What is the universe? 99.999999% Your atoms, the atoms that make up your body and everything in, in the universe, are 99.9999% your consciousness, all the thoughts and images and feelings that we all love so much and we're all obsessed with, 
but the awareness that allows you to have any thoughts and feelings as spirit is 100% nothing. Everything, the context of our entire life, we're completely obsessed with the content, or as in Gestalt they call it the foreground, and we pay, never pay any attention to the context, the background that makes the foreground possible. Does that make sense? Okay, so when I was in India, I did a self-inquiry course called the 12 Inquiries, and they had the, the funniest, most pompous name that you could ever imagine for nothing, and they called it the indestructible matrix <laughs> of pure space. And I just thought, that's such an awesomely ridiculous name for nothing. I have to write a poem about it. So here it is, and it's called the indestructible matrix of pure space. Say, so, I'm, I'm just been relaxing in the indestructible matrix <laughs> of pure space. It have a very nice tears, like coming face to face with grace. Not over here or over there, but all over the place. So I man can make haste slowly. And the sense of aloneness don't make me feel lonely. Because I'm an identity. Totally phony, <laughs> holy moly, there is no me, there is only the indestructible <laughs> pure space. It's a strangely familiar place, let's face it, the entire human race is based in it. Bumba cloth if we're not wasting it. What a waste of space. Fancy ignoring the very space that contains us. It's outrageous, and in the case of human evolution, it might even be dangerous. There's just too much focus on what might be facing us, and not enough focus on the instantaneous, indestructible <laughs> matrix of pure space. Analogous to timeless, infinitely spacious awareness, flawless, peerless, Fearless, but nothing special in our fairness. <laughs> Just this unobstructed effortlessness with which we're all blessed. Just rest. How much effort does it take to be aware you're awake? Think carefully before you answer because the quality of your life is at stake. The indestructible matrix of pure space is closer to you than you are it extends beyond the farthest galaxies farthest star it coordinates your neurochemistry and it services your calf it is existentially impossible for anything to be on a par the mental and physical universes support it like a breast supports a bra <laughs> and its only philosophical postulate is no, 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 no. <laughs> the indestructible matrix of pure space. See! So that, that's my clue to how to get past wanting and, and manifest successfully. And when I say manifest, it's I mean manifest something that will be fulfilling. That's the key. We can all manifest money. Donald Trump can manifest millions. There's loads of people in the world that have manifested loads, but they're still not happy. Their lives are empty of meaning and fulfillment. So that's not a good manifestation. I'm only interested in helping you to manifest something that's fulfilling. And the key to that is actually, uh, actually recognising that it's not the law of attraction, it's the law of radiance. Yes. You don't attract what you think about, you radiate who you are, and then your life reflects it. And if you think about it, that's how the universe works. The sun radiates heat and light, and that's what makes it the sun. The earth radiates creation. The trees and the mountains and the valleys and the seas, no, 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 no. And if literally that everything that we know as being the world is just the earth being the earth radiating itself from the center. That's what radius is, a radius of a circle. It's coming from the source, coming from the center. So it's the law of radiation. And whereas the law of attraction is 
the law of how to get what you want. The law of radiance is the law of how to give what you want. And that's the, that's the key. As long as you're coming from, I want to manifest this because I want it, even if you do manifest it, it will be unfulfilling. When you're coming from, this is who I am, and I'm radiating it out and aligning my thoughts with it, you're guaranteed to succeed. And as long as you're coming from, this is what I give, this is what I have, you're guaranteed to succeed. That's the difference. Does that make sense? Yeah. Come on, give me a round of applause. That's yeah. awesome. Okay, so that's, hopefully that will break your addiction to the, the law of attraction. Because it's just taking you down a blind alley and now you don't need to go that way because you know an alternative. Um, so, so, so it's happening all the time. You can't help but radiate. Now, there is, you know, the sort of people that Mohan was describing before are radiating who they truly are. That's what makes them masters or spiritual people. Most of us are radiating who we think we are. And that's what creates the lives that we find unfulfilling. Um, so the, 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 key, the key thing to do, and what, what I'm going to talk about, is that true manifestation is the practice of, I call it soul radiance. You can call it whatever you like, source, universe, God, goddess, spirit, whatever. I just call it soul because I'm a soul man, baby. And it's, it, to me, it's all about me and my soul. My soul is feminine. I'm married to my soul. And everything good in my life comes from my soul. And... I see the, you know, the universe as have, having a soul, a soul of humanity, etc., etc. So I call it soul, and so this is the law of soul radiance. And your soul is always radiating, but it's filtered through your egoic desires. And, and depending upon the nature of that filter is, is the life that you live. And there's pretty much two types of egoic desire. There's immature egoic desires and mature egoic desires. And, you know, I'm not saying one's bad or good, I'm just describing them as immature and mature, because that's accurate. When you don't know any better, all human beings go through a deve developmental process, and it's quite natural to have immature uh, ego desires. In a healthy culture, like some of the hunter-gatherer cultures that we've, we all come from, um, there is a structured way to help children, once they reach puberty, to, gen uh, to develop mature egoic desires. In our dysfunctional culture, which is an infantilizing culture that keeps people in a very low uh, state of development, we're encouraged to have immature desires until the day we die. And immature egoic desires are attention, approval, control, material security, fame, celebrity, all of that bullshit that you see everywhere you go all the time. That Those are um, immaturity, and you always know an immature egoic desire because it's always about want and it's always characterized by fear of loss. You know it's an immature desire because even if you get it, you'll still be unfulfilled because you'll be afraid that you'll lose it. So all of these stars and sports people, rich people, celebrities, uh, they've, got, they've got it all, haven't they? They've got the American, American dream. But if they do something wrong and the media goes against them, there's the terror of losing it. I won't be famous anymore. All these people that have got, as I said, uh, all these millionaires that got all this stuff, they're terrified of losing it. Or, they, or they're not even happy with what they've got, they want more. So they, they've got 10 million, they want 100 million. Does this make sense? So that's an immature, egoic desire. Any of those things that's characterized by fear of loss. A mature, uh, egoic desire, and but, you know, I'm saying this because when, there's nothing wrong with desire, and there's actually nothing wrong with ego either. I'm not down on ego. You can't be in, in this world in a body without an ego, and you need an ego to do what you do. Gandhi had a huge ego. So, uh, in, in go? Gandhi had a huge ego, so did Martin Luther King. All my heroes had massive egos, because to do massive work in the world, you need one. It's not, the ego isn't the problem, it's who's in charge. Is your ego in charge, or is your soul in charge? That's the only issue. So for a, um, a mature ego, uh, the desires are connection growth and contribution. And it's as simple as that. They're, they're not about what you want, they're about what you can give. You can't be connected if you don't give. You know, a mother who's the ultimate connection, a mother and a child. What's the, what's the, is the mother thinking about what she wants? At all? She's always giving, always giving, always. So connection is all about giving. Uh, you can't grow unless you give. Growth, you have, to, you have to give yourself to whatever it is. If it's learning a guitar, learning to drive, uh, learning to be a better listener, whatever it is, 
you have to surrender, as Philly was saying, give yourself to the process, give yourself to the moment in order to grow, yeah? And obviously to contribute, to make a difference. This is our deepest, our, our absolute deepest uh, need uh, is to contribute, is to make a difference. The reason it's our deepest need is because the universe is being the universe through everything in the universe. So you are basically the universe in a human suit. That's how I put it. A tree is the universe in a, in a, in a tree suit. A blade of grass is the universe in a grass suit, yeah? I mean, everything's the universe. So you are the universe in a human suit. So the universe is doing everything it's doing through the things that are in the universe. And uh, like the Earth, the universe is a, a homeostatic thing. It, it's self-regulating. And it's trying to self-regulate itself on this planet through you. And what you are, your purpose, your highest purpose, is also your highest joy. And that's how you know it's your highest purpose, because that's what the universe put you together and your particular genetic package and your particular strengths and weaknesses and family situation and karma and all of that, it put you together because that particular package can do something and contribute some, can contribute something to the universe that no other package can. And when you are doing that thing that no other package part of the soup of the universe can do, you will live a magical and meaningful. Does that all make sense? Yeah. Anybody not 100% agree with me? <laughs> <laughs> 10 minutes and I've got them. <laughs> um, it's, but the thing is, it's like the truth is always the truth and it's always simple and everyone gets it. You only need to explain it three times if it's not the truth. <laughs> if it's the truth, you just need to say it in simple terms, straight, and people go, oh yeah. Um, right, so. Okay, so I'm going to give you the four keys, if you want to write this down, the four keys to uh, aligning, well, to making sure that you're coming from a place of mature egoic desire and aligning those to your soul radiance, which is the process of, of, of fulfilling manifestation. So this, 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 you know, basically this is all, I, I mean, I'll tell you a little bit about where I came to this understanding. <laughs> Uh, but this is all uh, practice. It's all about practice, daily practice. It's what you practice every day. Whatever it is you want in your life, live it today. Right now, before I came up here, I, I just reminded myself that the ultimate feeling is gratitude. Whenever you're in a good situation, if it's love, joy, whatever, you always feel grateful. So the only feeling you need to concentrate on is gratitude. If you feel gratitude all the time, um, your life will be magic. So I just made sure I sat there and I was grateful for the opportunity to sit before you and then I know that I'm going to end up feeling grateful because if you, if you have the feeling first, that's true manifestation. <laughs> if you have the feeling first and you establish yourself in the feeling like an actor, generate the feeling of joy, you will end up having experiences that are joyful. So if you uh, establish the feeling of gratitude first, you will end up having fe thing, uh, experiences that make you feel grateful. So the four keys are... Um, Clarity of vision, I call them the four C's because it's always nice to have punchy little things that you can sell to people. Um, clarity of vision. Um, constant gratitude. Consistent action. And complete faith. Clarity of vision, constant gratitude, consistent action and complete faith. Those are the keys to, um, to manifestation in general, but specifically to manifesting from your mature egoic desires and not the unfulfilling ones. So I'll tell you a bit about my story. Um, so I, uh, back in 2001, I was managing director of a sort of media buying recruitment advertising agency, 70 grand a year, uh, fancy car, expense account, married, two kids, um, all, very, very long story as I've discovered on <laughs> radio, it was just, I can't tell you all of it, but all fell apart and I ended up going to live under a tree in Battersea Park for seven months and selling the big issue. And I had a bin liner full of books and a bin liner full of clothes and I just went into the park, Mark Twain's got a quote that says, um, the two most important days of your life are the day you were born and the day you find out why. And I knew at that time, I was like, I've got to find the purpose of my life. So I said to the universe, I give up, I'm going to be a bum, 
like, like Jules said in, in, in Pulp Fiction, I'm going to be like Cain and walk the earth. Cain and come through and walk the earth. And I said, right, I'm going to go and live under the tree. I never thought I'd ever come out. I said, I'm just, I give up. I, don't, I, don't, I haven't got a place in this world. I don't know why I'm here. And I just can't do it anymore. So I'm just going to live under the tree universe until you show me the purpose of my life. And um, I found it three months later at the age of 35. Never written a poem in my life. Poetry started pouring out of me. And 13 years later, I've made a beautiful life from being a performance poet, so it worked. Uh, but before that, um, the first, in fact, the first morning I woke up, um, actually the first night when I was in the park, I put my bin liner of books and clothes away, had my sleeping bag, and went to bed. <laughs> and I was afraid of three things. I was afraid of rain, it was April in England, um, and it did rain a little bit, but not too bad. I was afraid of bugs, because I'm a black guy. <laughs> uh, we don't like bog and ting them. <laughs> and, um, so I was afraid of being kind of like, you know, woke up crawling with bugs. That's why we don't camp, ski, or swim. I know, I know those are all, those are all cliches and, and, and people are breaking those taboos, but it's true. They're not often seeing black people camping, or skiing, or something, anyway. Um, so, so I was afraid of bugs, and then um, the, the biggest fear is I was afraid of being mad. I mean, think about it. I'm 35 years old, 70 grand a year a few months before that. I'm now lying under, in a sleeping bag under a tree in the middle of a central London park, and I'm just saying to myself, oh my god, is this what madness is? <laughs> this is how it starts. Like, there's always a mad guy in the black guy in the park, and I agree. Is that how it starts? I'm the mad guy in the park. Oh my god, this is how it starts. This is how they become the mad guy in the park. And, um, you know, I, I basically kept asking myself was like, if I was mad, and somehow I managed to get to sleep, and in the morning, I woke up. And I opened my eyes, actually I heard a bird singing, and I opened my eyes and the, the bird was about that far away from me. And the song it was singing was so beautiful, it might as well have been, Morning has brought me. And literally, and I'm not kidding, it was like waking up in a Disney movie, the sun was dappling through the leaves, I didn't know the sun could dapple, it was dappling through the leaves and casting rainbows on the dewdrops and all that. And uh, I woke up and I went, oh my god, like, this is heaven, I, I, I've woken up in heaven. And I can't go into too much detail, but what I discovered there was this, the, 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 the key to everything I teach, which is gratitude. What I realised was is that by giving it all up and becoming a nobody and uh, dying to all my roles and masks and identities, because we all have all these roles and masks and identities, and we think we are them, but you are the context, the nothing that is wearing the role or identity. And this is what I mean. We're so obsessed with the thing in the front, the role, the identity, that we completely forget about the true subjective who you actually are, and basically in that morning, I didn't have any role or identity anymore. I, was, I literally was a nobody. And I realised that in being a nobody, that just my bare existence was the most glorious and magnificent thing ever. Because <laughs> life is the greatest gift. And if you are alive, if you are existing, everything you love about life, music, <laughs> colour, sex, dance, films, talking to your friends, alcohol, drink, whatever it is you like about life, you cannot experience it without existence. You can't experience it without awareness. Yeah, you can't experience it without being there. So it is the greatest gift. And actually, you don't even need the things that you, you like. In itself, existence is bliss. That's what I woke up realizing. And you see it in a baby. Like a baby has got no reason, you know, to can't watch Breaking Bad, it doesn't know anything about Game of Thrones. The baby's got no reason to be happy about anything. And if it's not hungry or in pain, a baby is bursting with joy, right? For why? Why is it bursting with joy? What's it got to be joyful about? Existing. That is the actual, the, the basic default state of life, because life is the greatest gift. If somebody gives you the greatest gift, you're going to be grateful. That's our basic state. Anyway, so that's what I, wrote, uh, I woke up realising. And um, I, 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 I sort of created some very practical applications for this, because I didn't want it to just be... I basically had an Eckhart Tolle-like experience. For seven months, I was in a park in bliss the whole time. But um, it, wasn't, it didn't last, unlike Eckhart's in my case. Um, and it wasn't, um, it was different. It, the, the whole quality of it was different because I, I'm a very practical person. And I basically, in order to survive, I sold the big issue. Now, I, I am a bit of a salesman, so I wasn't worried about selling the big issue. I always knew that it's a great thing. At the time, you could buy it 50p and sell it for £1.20 and make 70p profit. And if you're homeless, it gives you an independence. I mean, basically, it's, it's like you're homeless, but you've got your own little business and you can look after yourself. So I thought, great, I'll do that. 
And for the first, uh, I actually started to sell it before I moved in the park because I was staying on someone's couch. And, uh, and I sold it for the, the first few days. And the way I sold it was kind of with high energy and like a salesman, but from a place of, basically, a place of want. Because I, was, I needed the money to survive, so I was kind of nervous about whether or not it would work. So the way I used to sell it was, um, good morning ladies and gentlemen, get your big issue magazine here, the only magazine that helps homeless people to help themselves, always better to teach a starving man how to fish than to give him food, always a good magazine today ladies, it's black Brad Pitt's in there, I fancy him, he's got my gym pits in it, and I would just go on, I would make loads of jokes and lots of energy, and I would sell better than most big issue sellers, so I sell about five to eight an hour, and you always make up some tips, so roughly I made about a pound a magazine instead of 70p, and so I made five to eight pounds an hour doing it that way, which isn't bad. But after I woke up in the park and I was in this state of bliss, um, what I noticed was is that when I was in the park and, and, and whenever I wasn't selling the big issue, I literally would be walking around going, la, 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 everything's beautiful, I love everything, everything's beautiful, I love everything. And then when I had to go and sell the big issue, there'd be this knot in my stomach, in my solar plexus chakra, and I'd be like, oh my God, what if I don't sell, what if I, it's slow, what if I, I don't make any money? And the fear of money, right, the fear of, you know, the fear of, the fear of money, uh, or not having it, would basically take my joy away. And it's a big thing for me, anything that takes my joy away, I just can't have it. I sing and dance on the tubes and I have been for like two, the last two years, because of the fact that I don't want anything, people's opinion of me to take my joy away, and it's like uh, Mohan was saying, it's like, once you're beyond praise or blame, and I've got a really good practice for that. But anyway, uh, so I didn't want anything to take my joy away, and I thought, well, how do I not feel this knot of anxiety and fear when I go to sell the big issue? And one of the reasons that I ended up in the park is I read a book called Conversations with God. Yeah! Oh, I know there are a few fans here. Make sure those of you who love Conversations with God. Yeah! Yes. But you really like it. Um, so, um, Conversations with God, uh, it doesn't matter if you believe or God or not. If you read this book, it's like, if, even if it isn't God, it's the wisest yeah. mother you've ever read anyway. And basically in the book, it, it, said, it said a number of things. And one of the things it said is that, um, similar to what Mohan said again, that basically the outer world is a reflection of the inner world. And uh, the best way to create something in the outer world is to uh, basically create your inner state and it will be reflected in the world. So I've, I've read that before and I thought, okay, I wonder if that's true. So, uh, and funny enough, so many things you were saying, I, I'm, I was thinking about saying. Uh, the first thing I did actually was... You were listening. Uh, I wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, they were. You know they were. You know, like, I talked to everyone and they were like, oh, he's got such a lovely energy. And I said, well, yeah, he talked about energy. You better have a good energy. <laughs> um, and... Uh, <laughs> Imagine if you didn't have a nice energy, you see my energy. I'm wrong here. <laughs> and um, so, um, so, 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 you know, how am I going to, um, so how, how do I create my inner state? So what I used to do was, so I'd wake up in a good state anyway, and, uh, and then I did some chakra exercises, and I did some chakra raising exercises. So I get all the colours, and I'd imagine the chakra spinning red, and then orange, and then yellow, and then green, and then blue, and then indigo, and then violet. And then by the time I finished doing it, I was felt like that. And then I would walk. It was about I lived in Batsy Park, and the biggest offices were in Vauxhall, so I'd walk at really high pace, get the blood pumping, get the body all moving, and I just make myself high. I just make myself joyful. And by the time I got to the picked up my magazines and then walked down uh, Victoria Bridge Road, I was buzzing like. Every morning I was totally buzzing, totally high, and then I would sell from there. So I, I call it selling from joy. And I went immediately from selling five to eight an hour at one pound to selling 15 to 20 an hour and making three pound per magazine because loads of people would buy and say, keep the magazine so I could sell it twice or three times. Loads of people will give me fivers. Loads and loads of people will give me fivers. Some people will give me 10, catching 20. So I was basically making... 60 pounds an hour <laughs> selling the Big magazine. And I just crossed my heart and hope to die. I mean, it's the absolute truth. And so this is where I get my understanding of manifestation from. It's like hardcore, practical, down-to-earth experimentation. Because what I used to do was, it felt like magic. It, it, in fact, it was magic. I could actually feel the law of radiance. I'd be, I'd, people would come up to me all the time and say, oh my God, you're so happy. Like, I've never bought the big issue, I heard this all the time, I've never bought the big issue before, but I just love your energy. I've never bought the big issue before, but I just love your energy. Here's 10 pounds, here's 10 pounds. People would be running to give me money because they like my energy. And I wanted to see how, uh, you know, I've got a quite scientific mind and I wanted to experiment with it. So what I would do is I would do, um, I would go to different pitches. So I had a really good pitch in Victoria, but I tried quieter pitches. Or I'd sell when it was raining, when you're not really supposed to sell. Or I'd sell on a, in the, after people had come home from work, because the best times are in the morning, lunchtime, and just after work. So I'd sell late in the evening. 
or I sell on a Sunday. So like I sold on rainy Sunday mornings, 15 to 20 magazines an hour. Like, where were these people coming from? That's what I felt like managed. Where there's nobody here, but still, every now and again, someone would come and give me five, five pounds. So, um, and I did this for seven months, and I, you know, so I, I'm not into belief. I was saying to, uh, to Michelle, sort of to Michelle, I, I, I'm not particularly interested in anything that requires you to believe me or, or to believe in something. Um, and so I test everything out for myself. So I don't want you to accept anything I'm saying, but I'm, I'm going to give you, uh, as uh, Philly did, what happened for me, and I encourage you to try it because the results will astonish you. So, um, so that was my big issue experience. And, and basically, I it clarified those four things I just gave you. So clarity of vision. And now, this is the key where, where we get things wrong. Um, I was interested in what you were saying, what Alexandra Bell's quote about know what you want, the first thing, and that's absolutely true. However, there's a subtle thing here because that know what you want, is it an immature egoic desire or is it a mature egoic desire? So the know what you want, which relates to my clarity of vision, <laughs> The key there is that the vision comes from your soul. The key there is not your vision that you've made up based on advertising and, you know, watching television. Because that will just get you on a path of manifesting something that's not going to fulfill you anyway. So the key to clarity of vision is receiving a vision. Every Modern Western culture is the only human culture in a million years that doesn't have a rite of passage for children to become adults. Every single other culture has some version of a vision quest. When a boy or a girl becomes, reaches puberty, they're sent off into the woods or the Arctic or the savannah to kill a lion if they're in Africa, whatever. But they're sent off on their own for three or four days, not to eat and not to speak, and to have a vision of their life purpose. That's how we've always done it. But we're the only ones who don't, and we wonder why teenagers get into gangs and drugs and no, no, no. Because we're developmental creatures, and every so any human being that reaches that age that doesn't have an elder to give them a structure of how to become an adult will basically become a goth or something mad like that. <laughs> That's what goth is And um, so we're the only human culture that doesn't do it and, uh, and that's why most of, us, most of us adults, the most basic thing in life, most of you don't know, why am I here? Like, most people don't know why they're here. Now because almost nobody knows it, we accept it. But if you want the reason, if there's a single reason, not the oligarchy or the elite, even though they already exist, there's a bigger reason why the world is a mess and we're destroying our planet and destroying ourselves. It's because we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> if you don't know what you're trying to do, if you don't know your purpose, you can't know what you're doing. So we've got six and a half billion people who are here to play a specific role in the universal self-creation, who don't know what they're doing. It's good, isn't it? It's like, we don't know what we're doing, it's that simple. And um, so, so this is the first thing. So the vision has to be given to you. Now, I, I don't have the time, but usually I do an exercise where you can find your purpose in five minutes. Uh, but what I can do is, if, if yeah. apparently you've all, um, just got all your email addresses. Yeah, if yeah you, happy for me to give, give it, to pass the email addresses on. Is anybody not happy? If you're not happy, let us know, and then you won't pass right, it on. I'll, 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 and then I'll send you, because I do all this stuff live, and I'm happy to do it in London for groups. Yasmin's going to hopefully help me um, uh, arrange some workshops in London. Um, but I do it online as well. And basically, so, so finding a purpose. So we can't do it in five minutes, but what, I'll tell you what to do, right? I've done four of these, this is what they call a DIY vision quest. I've gone out onto a mountain or into a wood or something like that and I've just gone for four days with plenty of water and you don't eat and you don't speak, and you don't take your mobile phone and you don't take anything else like that and you just be with yourself under a tree for four days. Vision. Guaranteed. I've taken other people on them, there are people, you can search it online, vision quest, there are people that do guide, guide, and I, obviously I wouldn't suggest, especially for the ladies, you go off on your own into the woods, but uh, you can, you can, there are people online that take your guided ones in the mountains and the pyramids and things like that. Maybe you get it through dancing. Maybe you get it through chanting. Maybe you get it through meditation. There's anything that brings you into the present moment with yourself and no distractions for a long enough time, you will find your vision. Because it's you, it's in you, it's literally in your genes. It's just waiting for you to be able to hear it and see it and feel it. And every, your mind is in the way. So you just go to something that allows you to be with yourself along. You'll hate it, by the way. The first two or three days will be a nightmare because you'll realise I'm fucking insane. 
The first thing you go, I am insane, I cannot stop my mind. My mind just thinks about the most ridiculous things. Girls, spurs, football, mad, mad, madness. And it's always two and a half days of madness and then all of a sudden peace. And then peace and then inspiration and then bliss. But you have to go through the madness first. So you, first thing is to receive a vision. So in the park, um, I basically lived under a tree. And I just had vision, 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 vision all the time. So I had the clarity of vision. Uh, and, and actually the vision was, I don't want selling the big I issue to take my joy away. That was my vision. That was the, that was the thing I was manifesting. Um, constant gratitude came with the territory, as I said. I learned that my existence was gratitude itself, so that came anyway. Um, consistent action, this is a big one. So consistent action. So in some of the things that um, Philly was talking about relate to some famous books, Think and Grow Rich and um, The Science of Getting Rich and all those kind of old school uh, manifestation -y type books. And, uh, and they're, they're, very, they're very true, and this is the secret doesn't really talk about this, is that, and, and Mohan talked about it, energy. Um, you can't manifest without energy. You have to work. You have to do something. So consistent action means in both ways. So it's consistently acting in alignment with what you're trying to manifest, but it also means action consistent with what you're trying to manifest. So if you're trying to manifest, um, I'll talk about myself, I'm trying to manifest, uh, basically my whole thing is like, when you get to a certain place and you're fulfilled and you don't, you don't not really come from what want anymore, uh, the only thing to do is expand. So it's like, because you know that the more you give, the more magical your life will become, the more you can contribute, the more you can make a difference. You just know that all the things that that part of you wants, it will get it if you forget about it and focus on how much you can give. So I'm, I'm trying to manifest, I want to be a philanthropist basically, a multi-millionaire philanthropist, so I can fund all of these communities that are building the more beautiful world our hearts know as possible. And um, so in terms of that, so I, I'm doing, I've got my website and all this kind of thing. So everything that I do, I do it as though I was already a multi-millionaire philanthropist. So I don't go around acting like somebody who wants to be a multi-millionaire philanthropist. I act like one. So when, when there's a choice of how much money to spend on something, I never think about how much things cost. I don't worry about money. Like, I just... Anything that's quality and good, I just do it. Um, there's a wonderful expression in the Bible, and this is with complete faith. So we're talking about um, consistent action, lacks and consistent, and it also talks about faith. I'm not a big Bible man, as you can probably tell, um, but there's a wonderful passion. There is some beautiful gems in there, and uh, one of them is, um, consider the lilies of the field. They neither soil nor, uh, sorry, soil. <laughs> they neither sow nor reap, nor gather into barns. No, no, no. Consider the lilies of the field. <laughs> they neither spin nor weave, yet not Solomon and all his glory are arrayed as such as these. Consider the birds of the air. They neither sow, nor toil, nor gather into barns. Um, but are you not as valuable as one of them? Which one of you can add one thing to his life through worrying? That's my favourite quote of all time. Like, literally, worrying is praying for what you don't want. Worrying is the absolute antithesis of manifestation. So, complete faith. And you have to get into the practice of this, because obviously we've conditioned for years and years and years, and years, and years to, 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 to worry. But complete faith basically means, as often as possible, doing whatever it takes to sink into your true identity, which is the indestructible matrix of pure space. <laughs> you, who you are cannot be destroyed, is perfectly happy, and will always win in the end. That is how I see the world. Like whatever happens to me, I'm going to talk about losing my leg in a second, but it doesn't matter what happens to me because I know that who I really am is indestructible. And I know that I am the universe and so everything that I want that is good for me is going to come to me anyway. So, And I still worry. I still have doubts. I'm human. They emerge. It's just that I don't give them focus and attention and they emerge and they go, ooh, like that. So you, they'll never go away but you'll learn what they are. You'll learn that they're just these mechanical reactions. They're just mechanical reactions, worry and doubt. And we think that they're worthy of our focus and attention, so we end up worrying and we end up doubting. But actually, they're just mechanical reactions. Now, I'm not saying that you should, should doubt what you hear or doubt what you, but I'm not talking about that kind of doubt. I'm talking about the kind of doubt about you know, the, the doubt that we really suffer from, which is, I'm not good enough, I can't do it, I can't have that. That kind of doubt, the doubt, the self-doubt. 
about yourself and your, again, as Mohan said, your ability to uh, permission, permission to have that. Uh, does that make sense? So, um, so action consistent with. So you've you've got to whatever it, and and what you're actually trying to manifest. Ten minutes. What you're actually trying to manifest is. Um, there's another wonderful expression in conversation with God. So this, this is my favourite definition of the purpose of all life and what it is that you, you should focus on manifesting. Forget manifesting the house, the, the relationship, the, the, the new trainers, whatever it is. If you just focus all your energies on manifesting this, it will take care of everything else. Uh, so in conversation with God, it says the purpose of all life is to recreate yourself anew in the next grandest version of the greatest vision you ever held about who you are. I'll say it again so you can write it down. To recreate yourself anew in the next grandest version of the greatest vision you ever held about who you are. And if you're doing that, the, 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 next, the next grandest version of the greatest vision is coming from source. As I said, you're the acorn that source wants to become an oak tree. And the image, the blueprint, the genes are already there. It's all already there for you. All you have to do is let it unfold unnaturally. Uh, uh, unnaturally? Let it unfold naturally. And the way it unfolds naturally, and I know it's a big hippie cliche, but follow your joy. Literally, like your joy is the universe saying, go that way. That's what it is. That's literally your joy in your bliss is the universe going, that's the way, that's the way. And if you feel, oh, I don't really like this, it's because you're off the wrong track. And all you have to do is take some time and sit under a tree and find your joy again. And it will just keep leading you. You don't have to think your way through life. Thinking is not for living. Thinking is for imagining, which is what you need to do to know, you know, to, 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 to create. But it's not for living. To actually live, your decision should be based on what you feel. And I, my best friend in the world, who's the master at this, Eliza, Whenever she does anything, she, I, I said, should we go, do you want to go to the park? She'll go, hold on a minute. No. <laughs> do you want to turn left? No. Everything she does, everything, she checks in. That's, and that's how I try to do that as much as possible. You don't do things because you think you should. You do them because you're told yes or no in the moment. And don't bother with thinking for that. It's a waste of, it's like trying to use a computer to look after a baby. It's the completely wrong thing. If you want to solve mathematical equations, use a computer. If you want to look after a baby, use care and love and that. So I'm going to finish off with a poem um, because uh, what I do, so all, all of this, I, went through, I, I don't know if I'll tell you about my leg, but yeah, so I went through this magical life, um, became a poet, quite well-known spoken word artist called Paradox, uh, lived in London for six years without a job, without a home, never worrying about money, uh, people just come to me, oh, do you want to put on a cabaret called Gods and Goss Goddesses, which I did for three years? Oh, do you want to, my BBC engineer friend, oh, do you want to record some uh, CDs of your poetry? Okay. And basically, whenever I need money, somebody would just come to me and say, do you want to do this? Oh, do you want to go to India to write your book? Here's £2,000. Do you want to live in a mansion in, in, in Hampstead for two years? Yeah, here's, you know, no job, honestly. Six years in London, living like a king, no job, no house, never thought about it, never worried about it. So uh, this, is, this is my experience that... Uh, the best thing you can do for yourself is to spend as much time in the indestructible matrix of pure space, being grateful, and knowing that you don't have to worry about anything. That's, you know, if you forget everything else, remember that. And, uh, and then I went to India, then California, then Mexico to Rainbow Gathering, joined a horse caravan, 30 people riding around Mexico on horseback, living like cowboys, wild adventure of a lifetime, jumped off a cliff into a river, hit a rock, did this. And... Um, Oh, too, too long a story, but worst thing that ever happened to me, best thing that ever happened to me, and it gets better all the time. Um, another example of um, uh, how, you know, as uh, Philly was saying, and everyone has been saying, you know, these uh, tragedies that happen to us teach us these lessons and open us up in ways that might, we might not have opened up. And basically, losing this made me, my heart burst open in, in such an incredible way. And since that time, I've focused less on being a poet and more on uh, being a facilitator and a catalyst for people to live magical, meaningful lives. 
created a workshop called The Art of Meaning, which has now got 2,400 students online. And now I'm, uh, I've got a website, which is at the moment is called Your Unstoppable You, but I'm changing the name to Escape the Salary Trap because I really want to focus in on what I've found is that you can help people live more meaningful lives and you can give them lovely practices and things that they can do. But if, if you don't like your job and you're spending basically most of your waking hours doing something you don't like, it undermines any work you do on your personal growth. So I've just flipped it all and I said, right, I'm going to get people out of jobs they don't love get them to find their purpose and the job they do love, and then they can, they've can they got all the time in the world to do all the growth and all that kind of stuff. So that's my real focus now. So it's called EscapeTheSaddleTrap.com, and it's in development at the moment, but when I get you emails, I can send it to you. So I'm just going to finish off with a poem, which um, kind of tells my whole story in poetic form, and it's called Awesome Epidemic. And it's really, when people say, when I say, I'm a one-legged existentialist stand-up beat poet, <laughs> um, people say, what do you mean you're a one-legged existentialist stand-up beat poet? And I say, oh. I've got a poem about that. And this is an awesome <laughs> Back in 2001, I started on the path of becoming a bum. Not because I was glum or sad or anything like that. In fact, 2001 was one of the best years I've ever had. Although at the time, on the surface, things did look pretty bad. But I never felt so glad. I was just glad to be alive. I felt like I was five. I felt like I'd never die. I was seeing nothing but angels on transport for London. All my value judgments were becoming utterly redundant. Faced with the unbearable lightness of being, the great-great-grandmother of all our feelings. And as, I, as my I'm not good enough scripts were torn asunder, I found meaning living next door to all my so-called blunders. I was in love with love itself, scuba diving its ocean. The great mystery was moisturising me with this baby lotion. So all the notions I picked up from my folks and my mates, all the stories I believed and made into my faith, became meaningless. And I awoke to the meaning of meaninglessness. The space where nothing matters. It's much better than you'd expect. After all, it's the only space where meaning can truly be expressed. Finally! I awoke, finally, I got the cosmic joke. All praise is due to Allah. Only the mistakes belong to this bloke. Paradoxically, while it was all coming together, my life was falling apart, proving when in bed with the divine, the divine also farts. I lost my wife, my son, my mum, my job and my cup. None to death's door, thank God, but a door that was only just a jar. So determined to find my purpose, I went to live under a tree in Vassy Park. It was a big issue boot camp that gave birth to my art. April the 11th to October the 31st, 2002. What a crazy thing to do. Especially when you only have a bin liner of books, a bin liner of clothes and a sleeping bag with you. I was scared of rain, bugs and madness. That first night's the hardest. Am I mad? I asked myself. Does doing this make me a complete mentalist? But I woke to the gentlest bird song serenade in my ear. Three little birds beside my doorstep. Yeah, and the song they seemed to sing was Morning Has Broken. And just like that first morning, it felt like God had spoken. And I realised I must be mad. Life couldn't possibly be this beautiful. But mad ain't so bad when you're willing to lose it all. Surrender makes all kinds of mad usable. And evolution proves the unusual can be very useful. The next seven months was either the mother of all second childhoods or a profound mystical experience in a modern urban environment. <laughs> Obviously both, but that's not a boast. <laughs> Anyone can do it. It's like beans on toast. All I did was to commit to living my life's true purpose. I dived slap bang in the middle of life's three ring circus. My daily practice was the mystic magic of the great mystery. Be it earning enough money to feed me and keep me clean in the city. So I made a mystic practice out of selling the big issue. It's funny, selling mystically makes selling a piece of piss you, see? I sold so fast, in an hour I could make £60. I once sold 25 in 15 minutes. Hourly, that's £560. Damn, that's more than some New York lawyers are pulling down. Man, I reckon I was the best big issue seller in town. Okay, yeah, that was a boast. My bad. But those seven months in Battersea Park were the best seven months I've ever had. It was when paradox was birthed in me by my beloved mother tree, and I started writing poetry for the first time in my mid-thirties. Ecstatic, existential, stand-up beat poetry. Very not off the shelf, 
Very good for your health. Very, oh my God, I finally found myself. <laughs> yeah. Homeless big issue seller. Living in infinite wealth. <coughs> infinite wealth. So that takes care of the existential stand-up beat poet part. What about the one-legged part? I hear you ask. Well, see as you ask. I got back from India in 07 after a mystical six-month stay. Then had a nervous breakdown and became suicidally depressed. In a good way. <laughs> Not that it felt good at the time, of course. I felt cut adrift in the abyss and totally disconnected from source. So I ran away to go trimming in Northern California. It was still a possibility that someone would have to call the coroner. But I escaped alive by the skin of my teeth. Thanks to people whose hearts are sweet. People who helped me get to Mexico with the strength of their belief. And people who helped me get home eight months later when my knee was at its peak. After I smashed my leg in a diving accident and got gangrene. And was life-savingly looked after by three rainbow queens. Basically, it was people's humanity that saved me. From becoming a sad, tragic, broken, below-the-knee amputee. I was drowned by a tsunami that struck land internally. A wave of unconditional love. Well worth an arm and a leg if you ask me. And because I happily go luckily take the mickey out the whole one-legged thing, it inspires people to be free. And I found that freedom's infectious. Awesome epidemic that would be. Thank you very much for listening.